Do U.S. presidential campaigns have an impact on other countries? Certainly they do, says presidential scholar Stephen Wayne of Georgetown University. He'll explain next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. What should we make out of what are possibly the most colorful and entertaining presidential campaigns in U.S. history? For answers, we turn to Stephen Wayne, a presidential studies scholar at Georgetown University and the author of The Road to the White House. Welcome to the show, Dr. Wayne. Thank you. The Road to the White House, some of us have been reading for a long time. Uh, this book is in its 10th edition. And every four years, you take on the presidential campaign and election process. What inspires you to keep doing that? Well, I, I love politics. Um, I think it's important for students and the public to be educated about political events and about elections. I think it's important that they participate. It makes our democracy stronger. So what kind of input do you get from readers of the book? Well, the book is designed primarily for college students, and they try to absorb information. And the general impact I get is, gee, this is interesting, but I never thought it was so complicated. <laughs> so talk about complicated. We're yeah. in the midst of uh, a presidential campaign season that has become much more complicated in addition to being colorful and entertaining. Yeah. And But at some point, the colorfulness, the entertaining aspects of it have to go away and we become serious. Um, do you see that happening in this campaign? I do. Um, the nominations are primarily about personality and the nominations about taking positions and getting people involved. And most of the people involved are fairly strong partisans. And so the personality focus dominates, particularly in this election when uh, the uh, news media has emphasized some of the statements that the candidates have made and some of the charges, personal charges, they've made against each other. But at some point, we're going to have two other things will come into play. One is the partisanship of the electorate, how they're directed. And, to what type of person has the qualities for what we imagine to be the president. You know, there are two types of qualities that we want in the president. One are generic to the office, strength, leadership, vision, energy. Those seem to relate to the office. The other kind of personality traits are where did we see the current incumbent lacking? So after the Clinton administration, uh, candidate Bush emphasized um, his ethics and his character. And after the Bush administration, candidate Obama emphasized that he was going to transform policy and he was going to transform politics from the divisiveness that we had in the last four years of President Bush's administration. Now, at the end of the Obama administration, candidates are trying to demonstrate more of a feel, more of a direct feel and emotion to the people. And at the same time, they're trying to project uh, a broad the board knowledge and experience and kinds of imagery that we need in a president to direct our country. Now, we've had a lot of candidates on both sides, but especially on the Republican side. And does that have something to do with the fact that the incumbent president is not running? Well, that's exactly why you always have the incumbent has an advantage. Only three recent incumbents, Hoover, Carter and George Herbert Walker Bush have lost. So if you're a challenger, you, want, you don't want to challenge an incumbent. So we started off this time around with 17 Republican candidates, which I think uh, is pretty much of a record, mm -hmm. having that many candidates. But there's another reason that there have been a lot more candidates now. 
And that is because of the Supreme Court decision, the Citizens United decision, which permits the formation of what we call super PACs, candidate-oriented super PACs. And you can contribute. There are no limits on the amount of money you can contribute. So what we found in 2012 is that the super PACs allowed Newt Gingrich and it allowed Rick Santorum to stay in the race much longer than they otherwise would have against Mitt Romney. And the thought was by some of the candidates, well, I can have a chance too. All I need is two or three wealthy backers. That's what Rick Perry had this time, two or three wealthy backers, because he didn't get any more. And that was one of the reasons he dropped out. Is this a time when you expect to see more policy-oriented discussions than before, or is it still personality at this stage? I think it's still primarily personality because the candidates on both sides are appealing to their mainstream partisan voters. And so they make appeals that are pretty similar because the beliefs of the mainstream voters are similar. So if Bernie Sanders appeals to, it talks about income inequality and he talks about corporate welfare, uh, Hillary Clinton is going to have to respond by saying, I'm opposed to income inequality and I'm not controlled by corporate contributors in one way or another. Similarly, the Republican candidates all have a similar opinion on uh, the need for law and order and to maintain the border and prevent internal terrorism and how to do it. So I think we're still going to see the emphasis on personality. But as we approach the election, candidates have to sound more presidential. And they can't just shoot from the hip. And they can't make or shouldn't make statements which may appeal to their mainstream, but would be viewed as outrageous by the general electorate. So I think we'll see a little bit of the toning down of the campaign. One other thing that we should talk about is that the proportional voting in the Democratic Party and up through the middle of March in the Republican Party makes the race appear fairly close. And it extends the race for a longer period of time. So the rules the states have and the voting procedures will extend the process almost to the end for both parties. You and I talked about this very, very early in the process. And I don't think, maybe you did, because you have more insights than most. But most people I talked to didn't expect to see the Donald Trump phenomenon on the Republican side and the Bernie Sanders phenomenon on the, on the Democratic side. Um, what, what accounts for that, regardless of the outcome of the campaigns and, and the election? I think analysts are going to be studying what those two men did for quite some time. Well, uh, I would say that the main difference between this nomination contest and the previous ones we had was that this contest was all about media coverage. And in each of the candidates' way, Donald Trump and eventually Bernie Sanders, they got the media coverage. In Trump's case, because he used politically incorrect rhetoric, and that was newsworthy. In some cases, uh, because he took very strong uh, stands on uh, uh, the immigration and terrorism issues. And in some cases, because he appealed to the anger against, against special interests by saying, I'm so rich I can't be bought. I'm my own person. And that is very appealing to people in both parties who are discontent with government or the direction of government or just don't like politicians because they believe, rightly or wrongly, that politicians will say what people want to hear, not what they're truly going to do. In Sanders' case, I think it was the authenticity and passion of his appeal and the power of the speech that ignited an idealism among the Democrats, primarily not minority, but mainstream Democrats, that had somehow been lost from the Roosevelt, Kennedy, Johnson era. 
Uh, labor has declined in importance. Manufacturing jobs have gone abroad. And this used to be the base of the Democratic Party. So he's reignited the base, not so much in the people who've lost their jobs or who have retired, but in educated youth who think that his argument itself is very appealing, even though they might not personally suffer from the income inequality at this point in their life and their professional career. We've had a, an awful lot of debates in this campaign. I don't know, it seems like there have been more than ever. Are you satisfied with the quality of the discussion on the issues, or are we not supposed to be satisfied? Because these aren't debates like debates used to be in presidential well, campaigns. Well, we're probably not supposed to be satisfied. Obviously, what we have not experienced is Lincoln-Douglas debates. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we have experienced in these debates is a high-viewing audience. 24 million watched the first Republican debate, 23 million watched the second, 15 million watched the first Democratic debate. And while we have no evidence to support the contention that the electorate is more knowledgeable, we do have empirical evidence to support uh, the belief that people are more interested in this campaign. We have higher turnout in the Republican primaries than we've ever had before. So it has generated interest in the candidates. It hasn't really promoted the depth of policy discussion or um, learned policy discussion. There's been a lot of name calling and stuff like that. Unfortunately, people are just not interested in extended policy debates because the issues are very complex and people don't have the time, the energy, maybe the background to appreciate it or see how it really affects them. If they wanted to uh, get policy discussions, they could watch uh, PBS or C-SPAN, but a lot of people prefer the short, quick mass media on cable or through social media and the internet. You talked about the, the name calling. It seems like we've really gone to the low road in, in this campaign. Do you think it can get worse? Well, the name calling has been primarily on the Republican side, not the Democratic side. What happened on the Democratic side is when Sanders maintained his popularity and generated enthusiasm and raised money, Mrs. Clinton had to take him seriously. For the first nine months or so, she didn't even refer to him by name. Uh, but they haven't personally been charging one another. In fact, when Mrs. Clinton, uh, when in the early debate, they asked a question uh, about the emails, he said, I couldn't care less about her emails. So that really put it. On the Republican side, it's been pretty vicious. And what Donald Trump has done has been to try to use his rhetoric to characterize candidates in negative ways. And that characterization, to some extent, has stuck in the minds of people who participate. He called Senator Marco Rubio Little Marco. He's a short man. He's shorter than Trump. But that limit, little image sort of translated that he just isn't up to the presidency. He called uh, uh, Senator Ted Cruz Lion Ted. Um, and there are some people who say, well, you know, his, he'll say what you want him to do. He's a politician. Trump is not. That's Trump's virtue. So to some extent, the name calling in the short run has helped uh, Donald Trump. Whether in the long run, when people consider the presidency and how they want the president to behave, that will help him or become an albatross around his neck, we'll wait and see. But it could become an albatross. Hillary Clinton has, is designing her campaign as Trump is not the kind of presidential person, we, not the character, doesn't have the personal attributes we want in the presidency. If Ted Cruz were the nominee, she would design his, her campaign much like Obama did, 
this candidate is ideologically to the right, I'll represent the Senate, I'll represent the center, I'll represent the middle class. So it would be a very different type of campaign depending on who the opposition would be if Mrs. Clinton gets the nomination. You mentioned Marco Rubio. Am I remembering correctly at one time that you were speculating that he might be the Republican Barack Obama, or was that somebody else who... I didn't speculate that, but I did think as did many of the Republican establishment, that he would be the toughest candidate the Democrats would face. One, he comes from Florida, which is a, a large competitive state. Uh, two, uh, he could appeal to the Hispanic community in their language and among their issues. Uh, thirdly, he was a very smooth talker and the like. But you know, Barack Obama, fell in popularity, and the one thing that Marco Rubio and Obama had in common is that they were relative newcomers. They had just come to the Senate, they didn't have a lot of governing experience, and according to his Republican critics, that's why Obama, in their opinion, has not done so well. So what, what happened with Rubio? Rubio couldn't find a base within the mainstream. Um, Trump appealed to angry people, to people who were fearful of the economic situation and social change, to people who wanted a demonstratively strong leader as judged by his business success. Cruz uh, appealed to uh, social conservatives and economic conservatives. He remained true to their ideals. Rubio didn't have a base. And he couldn't, he had to be conservative, so he couldn't campaign as a moderate candidate. It didn't really help Jeb Bush very much, and John Kasich has had minimal help in that. Uh, and he couldn't, he, he, he had taken positions on immigration that suggested he wasn't as tough on it as uh, Senator Cruz or uh, Donald Trump. And so he tended to campaign in fairly wealthy suburban areas around large cities, and that was not sufficient. He never established a core base, a core group of people to whom he could appeal, except for the Republican establishment. And what does that consist of? Uh, maybe about 300 elected officials and an equal number of big contributors. 600 people is not enough yes. to nominate a candidate. Talk to us about the issues that are important in this campaign as compared with past campaigns. I know anecdotally you hear a lot of people talking about the economy, talking about political violence and prospects for political violence, talking about safety and security. Are, are these issues that different from issues in past campaigns? Well, uh, the first thing I'm going to say is that there's no consensus on what the most important problem is today. Uh, about 30% will say economic, but some are talking about jobs, and some are talking about income inequality, and some are co talking about corporate taxes or corporate welfare, however you want to put it. Uh, and then you turn to non-economic issues, and the thing that brings the highest amount of attention is dissatisfaction with government, where about 15 to 17% will say that's the most important problem. And then some people say immigration, and some people say terrorism. Only 3% say foreign policy. There is no one principal issue that separates Americans other than the strong ideological partisan division that we've had in our country since the 1990s. Talk about the foreign policy piece. It was a very, very small number, and yet in my opinion, foreign policy couldn't be more important in, in Foreign policy in general is not, uh, is not important. Uh, terrorism, domestic, is important. If we fear, if we, God forbid, had another terrorist attack, that would make national security a much more important issue. Uh, Americans have reacted negatively to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. A majority of people do not want to get us involved in another large military confrontation. And yet, the power that we had as a nation following World War II, where we 
and then we competed with the Soviet Union for domination and influence over the world, that power has dissipated. And many people yearn for the time when America can more strongly project its power, economic and military, and its democratic values. But if, if something like that were to happen, or if there should be something else that has global repercussions, would the foreign policy piece suddenly jump to the forefront or become more prominent in the conversation? The foreign policy piece would become more prominent if it directly involved U.S. military, or if there was a direct threat to the United States. We hear a lot about the the missile uh, rattling in North Korea and a video that was shown that says they could take out Washington, D.C. or something like that. So that would be an issue. If we fell into an economic recession, trade or the uh, loss of jobs, that becomes more of an issue. I'm not sure that's, I'm not an economist, I don't think that's gonna happen before uh, the election. Uh, if a country were to drop out of the European Union, if there were to be a, another dispute between Russia and the Ukraine, that would make the news, but it's not what people care about most. They care about their, their own security, they care about their jobs, and they care about their future. And the big change in America has been the optimism that some people used to have that the future is always going to be better than the present. They've lost that optimism right now. And part of the problem today is that we've gone through very major social, technological, and economic changes. And it's left some of the people who were at the top now more towards the bottom and they're angry, they're frustrated, they're discontent, and they focus that discontent not on themselves, but on the government who provided the trade that lost the jobs, on the government who got us involved in military action, on the government who allowed in or didn't properly uh, control the borders. So it's not my fault, everything is blamed on the government. What is your sense of how foreign policy discussions in the campaign, to the extent that they're had, play in, in other countries? I think other countries are sophisticated about our political system, and they realize that the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans have led America over the years to a more isolationist stance than they could have. I think uh, they are a little disappointed that we don't have more sophisticated discussions about foreign policy issue, but foreign policy is important in one very important respect for the presidency. You have to be judged competent in foreign policy. We don't, uh, I mean, look what happened to certain candidates like Ben Carson, who couldn't answer foreign policy questions, or even the criticism Donald Trump has gotten when he couldn't name foreign policy advisors and said, don't worry, I'll be knowledgeable when I get to the White House. Part of the criteria for judging the president is their capacity to engage in these very complex international interchanges. So it's an important component of who we think is best qualified to be president. In an indirect way, foreign policy will be important. On a direct debate approach, it probably won't be as important. There'll be China bashing, uh, there'll be Putin bashing, but I think the outcome of the election is going to depend more on who Americans think will be better for their future as the President of the United States. Thank you so much for joining us you. today, Dr. Wayne. Thank you for having me. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.